and welcome to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging field of data science. We bring the best minds in data, software engineering, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Now here are your hosts, Frank Lavinia and Andy Leonard. Hello and welcome back to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging fields of data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. If you like to think of data as the new oil, then you could consider us like Car Talk, where we focus on where the rubber meets the virtual road. And with me on this epic road trip down the information superhighway, as always, is Andy Leonard. How you doing, Andy? I'm doing pretty good, Frank. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm uh, doing good. I um, had an interesting uh, talk uh, yesterday, and we're recording this on August 2nd. Um, it'll probably go out the following week. Uh, where I gave a presentation to a bunch of high school students from around the world who uh, attend like a, a summer program at Georgetown. Very cool. Yeah, it was interesting stuff for sure. And um, it was uh, a bunch of kids came up to me for advice and stuff. And I was like, wow, I'm a, I'm a role model now. That's that that's cool. Didn't see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been a role model to me before, Frank. So for a while. Oh, thanks, man. Thank you. Yeah. So today's show, we're going to do something a little different. Wait a minute. I should probably ask you what's up with you. If you... No, no, no. It's okay. It's all good. <clears throat> we should skip what's up with me. Oh, yeah, yeah. We'll save that for another, um, another show. <laughs> That's okay. Let's go do something different. <laughs> all right. Um, so uh, we've, been on the, uh, we've been online or on the air. I don't know how to phrase that for podcasts, but we've been doing this for now, what, about 14 months we've been yes. live? Yes. And um, 138 shows, somewhere about. Wow. Um, 61,000 uh, downloads. Nice. But I'm super excited today. And do you know why I'm super excited? Why are you super excited today, Frank? We've got a bunch of listener mail. What? Yep. Listeners have not only listened 61,000 times, apparently, mm -hmm. which, you know, I need to tell mom thanks for listening. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> Maybe it was a Russian bot, Andy. It could be. Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> More later. Uh, yeah, so not only that, but there's some people have taken the time to actually communicate with us. Right. That's and awesome. um, they've written to us before and stuff, and... Um, but they asked some very kind of pointed questions that are kind of, I think, uh, I think on, on everybody's mind. And we, oh, I think we both kind of thought, you know, this would be a good show. Yeah. Uh, to address this. Originally, I was going to do it as a data point. But then um, the, the way Facebook pages work is that um, if you, you're signed up as an admin and I'm signed up as an admin, so we can kind of both communicate. Yep. And at this, so it's like a shared mailbox. So like, well, then you answered them. And I was like, hmm. You know, maybe it's something because I'd like to get your opinion too. <laughs> well, well, so. sure, and yeah, that's um, and Facebook pages have changed recently too. Yeah, they they keep Zuckerberg's model is move fast and break things, <laughs> uh, which I don't know if that's a good idea uh, anymore. When you're in startup mode, I think it's a uh a good model to have good yeah. with an asterisk to it. Cause breaking yeah. things should not be your goal. Improving things should be your goal. Well, things are going to fail and failing. Things fast. are going to fail. Right. Right. I, I get it. I, I mostly support it. Right. Yeah. I'm kind of on the fence about that. It's kind of like the philosophy of fail fast. It's like, eh. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I've <laughs> seen it misused and abused and I'm not going to say where that's, <laughs> that is true. That is true. So, and you know, the, the places I've seen it not work well is where they say the words fail fast. Right. But yet you're punished for failing. Yeah. Which is kind of defeats the purpose. It's just kind of like somebody saw something or read a book and was like, Oh, let's do this. And then yeah. didn't explain it to their underlings who then just had a field day with it. Could be. Yeah, it could be. But I'm, I get it. And I think um, I think you made a good call. I think it's a broader topic than the typical data point. Although you did a data point um, a couple of weeks ago, the Facebook uh, part of it ran 
probably 20 minutes, maybe more. Oh, yeah, that was a good one. That was, um, it that really was our was best. Good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was a fantastic data point. So I don't, I don't know. I think this is going to go longer than that, though. It probably will. And yeah. I think the, um, the other thing I did why I went 20 minutes is because, uh, if I see people are on the, uh, on the live stream, I'll just kind of do an impromptu Q and a, if they're interested. Yeah. And that, that's actually where our first question came from cool. a gentleman named Avinash. And I believe he's based in India based on, uh, he said, Hey, I know it's late and it was, um, you know, but he said it's morning here. So based on that alone, uh, uh I'm assuming that he's in India. Also his, uh, Facebook avatar has the Indian flag colors. Well, b- both, you know, both good clues. Both good clues. Could be wrong, but in data science, you don't have to be right. You just have to be mostly right. <laughs> and I think that deserves one of those. All right. So great. here's his question. Here's um, Avinash's question. Avinash's question. Um, there's more to it, and his prose is actually pretty good, but I don't want to – I think basically is his question is uh, pointing out that Microsoft has two – um, let me restart that. So his question basically boils down to, uh, Microsoft has two kind of certification tracks, right? right? There's the traditional MCP ones and now the new edX classes. Right. The professional and program, Microsoft the professional program. program. Right. 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 And, uh, he asked a bunch of questions on, on Quora and stuff like that. And, um, it's really um, – it's an interesting question because I think – I've bumped into this too. I actually found it quite annoying because when I did work at a Microsoft partner um, earlier this year, in order to get certain uh, perks inside the partner programs, you have to have X number of employees certified in something. Right. Right. So if you want to be um, you know, a certified AI solution provider, we needed to have so many people with um, – you know data and AI tests, you know, that right. have passed those tests. Right. So, so the old what, or legacy certifications, the old legacy certifications um, where you have to go to a testing center and you sit there and um, you know, they, they basically put all your stuff in a locker and it right. feels like you're going to an airport or something like that. And, yep. and then you go into a room and you're in front of the computer and it asks you questions. Right. Right. Um, that's, I, I, I'm sure there's a better name for it, but the traditional certification program. Yes. Um, and those tests tend to cost, uh, like $300. Yep. And you have to be near a testing center. Yes. Right. Um, the other ones, kind of the new wave, the MOOC style, uh, but massively online open courseware, uh, type program is the typically are free to take the class, but you have to pay for a certification. And in right. fact, with, with edX, it's pretty much, that's how they roll. Right. So every course available on edX.org. edX.org is a, um, I guess, a, a nonprofit that Microsoft has partnered with to deliver a series of courseware. Right. Um, particularly in the data science. And when I started, they only had the one track. Now I think there's about five or six. Okay. Um, there's the, obviously, the data scientist one, which is how this whole movie got started. <laughs> um, then there's the big data engineering one, which you and I did together. Yep. Then there's the AI engineer one that uh, I am ninety percent done with, but um, because of some big projects Andy and I have, have cooking, I uh, wasn't able to meet the deadline. Although I did have a valiant eleventh hour try, but um, <laughs> um, did not work out. Uh, and, but I'm not this, discouraged. I'm well, sorry. What? That's okay. I was just going to interrupt there and say this should be an indication to our listeners. So Frank does most of the work. And when I say most, I mean like 99% of the work. I show up and look pretty, which if you've ever seen me. (laughs) So anyway. You woke up that that way, right? I don't do that well. But I do. (laughs) Frank does most of the work. I'm not making that part up. He's he's engaged doing this and he's doing all of the work. So, um, you know, Frank should get most of the credit. Well, thank you. So our listeners should also know, given my history of uh, being intense about these certifications and self-learning, that um, the size and scope of the projects we have planned 
Um, and plus, you know, being out in Vegas for a week kind of uh, derailed me by, you know, a certain amount of time. Now, that's not an excuse, um, you know, but it just is what it is. And well, Frank, I could take it again in October. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you'll get it. I'll get it. I mean, it was just, um, uh, it's just, you know, even I slip up, you know, so, but I mean, I, I, of course, being the stats nerd that I am now, um, I figured out that um, this is the first time I missed a deadline for edX. Wow. Which after like 35, 33 courses is about just under 3%. Yep. So 97% success rate. Not too shabby. But uh, now with that sidetrack over, but I guess it's not really a sidetrack. It's uh, it's, it's about edX. Um, So basically his question is, you know, which should I pursue? And, and I'll just just kind of spit out my opinion and thoughts on this. The advantage to the traditional program is that people know it. Right. Right. Uh, It's something that people understand and they, 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 they know kind of how that works. The disadvantage is, and I think this is why Microsoft really put a lot of uh, weight behind something like edX is, um, there's, there's a couple of problems with the traditional certification program. One, the cost, right? Uh, and two, you have to be near a testing center. Now, if you live in the U.S., that's not really a big problem for most of us. But I suspect that um, given Sacha's repeated use of the phrase, uh, you know, we want to empower every person on the planet to achieve more, I think right. the goal was to embrace uh, these online courseware that mm-hmm. could be done remotely. Right, right. And at a much cheaper cost. Um, I mean, $99 is still, in some parts of the world, a lot of money. Um, it, it's a lot. It was a lot of money when I was growing up. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, I'll, uh, I don't want to burst your bubble, Frank, but that's not chicken change here. I should say that different. That's not chump change in Farmville. Uh, oh, yeah, good point. Um, I know in San Francisco, like, you know, that's like what, um, an Uber ride and a couple of lattes, but, um, (laughs) but, uh, in San Francisco, goodness, it is pricey in San Francisco. Uh, In, uh, in DT, in, in DC, it's, it's still a lot of money, but when you, in the context of when I was, uh, laid off, I looked at the other options at the time. Now this was 2016. Uh, basically, you know, there was a Maryland-based uh, private university. They wanted uh, $15,000. And for their cert- data science certification program, very well uh, established. Right. A prestigious engineering school <laughs> in Massachusetts, which you can probably figure out who I'm talking about, <laughs> wanted $45,000. Wow. So in the context of, at the time especially, because edX classes used to be $49. I was just about to say, yeah, back then they were 49 bucks. So, you know, 49 times 10, I'll let you folks do the math, compared to $15,000 is, is a bargain. Even even now at the $99, right? So it's about $1,000 to do an entire track. Right. Because um, the data science, AI, and ML one both have 10 courses you have to take. Right. Um, uh, the dev apps one and the web dev one are slightly bigger or smaller. I forget, but I mean, you're talking about that scale, right? I mean, at right. most we're talking about $1,300, right? Um, which it makes it a lot more approachable, makes it a lot more understandable. Um, you know, particularly for folks who live in parts of the world where, um, you know, it's not quite as expensive as, uh, DC, San Francisco, or even Farmville. Yeah. Um, you just need to have internet connection, which is kind of a, another rant I'll go on another day. <laughs> but um, the uh, the point of it, though, I think the the thing that really kind of uh, chapped my um, – oh, I don't want to say that word. But the thing that kind of ticked me off yeah. was um, earlier this year, you know, I think as of January, I think I had like 29 or 27 certifications. Right. Right. But in order for my previous um, uh, employer to get credit to be an AI partner, which they did get, I had to go to a testing center and do it, despite the fact I had 27 certifications that were related and all relevant. Yeah. No, I I totally get that because um, I'm in the same boat. Uh, I own and operate enterprise data and analytics. We 
are a uh, Microsoft partner, and we're trying to climb up the food chain, uh, both in, uh, in the data uh, sphere and also in data science. And we're facing the same thing. And I have a certification now, a Microsoft professional program uh, certification in big data. You do too. You and I did the mm -hmm. capstone together back in April. Yep. Uh, which I thoroughly enjoy. And um, I, it doesn't, it doesn't count. It doesn't make the list of things that, you know, count towards me or enterprise data and analytics becoming a, you know, a, a gold partner at, at Microsoft. And that has implications. I mean, it, it just does. It, it defines a lot of the relationship, um, mostly on Microsoft side of the house, what, what people in Microsoft sales can, you know, how they can interact with me. It, it just, there's a pecking order. Right. And I'm at the bottom of that list almost. I'm, I'm not quite at the bottom, I'm, but, but yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, there's gold and there's silver. Um, I'm not, I'm not at the 10 level, but you know, I'm not a precious metal by any stretch. <laughs> and, of course, as the Microsoft employee here, I have to point out that uh, Andy's comments not reflect those of my employer, <laughs> uh, as well as we do cherish each and every one of our partners. Um, how was that? Well, there's not. Uh, so I should I should clarify. There's there's benefits to being a Microsoft partner. Don't get me wrong. And, oh, yeah. And it's something that I want for the company. I mean, there's benefits, I think, all around, uh, especially for a small a boutique like enterprise data and analytics. That's one of the reasons why, you know, I want to, I want to, I want everything that I do to, uh, that I think should result in counting towards that, to count towards it. If that, if that sentence makes sense, it's the same sort of thing. The company, the company you were working with before Frank, before you were with Microsoft, they are also a, a smaller uh, right. boutique type consulting firm and they were trying to do the same thing that I'm trying to do probably for the same reasons. And, you know, and I totally get it. Oh, um, definitely for the same reasons. And I'm not mad at them. I just always yeah, thought I, it was kind of, I'm not mad at them. I'm, yeah. I'm not upset with Microsoft about it. The, the, you know, the, the deal is, you know, they, it's their program. They make the rules. They've got every right to do that. I totally respect it. I promise I'm not complaining. I'm just looking at it kind of like, kind of like this. And I think this is similar to what you said earlier. Um, I think Microsoft is striving. And I think Satya's behind this is, is striving to make, um, to make this very democratic, to, uh, to make it so people all over the world who don't have, you know, don't own a car, <laughs> who, right. who can't get in a car and drive to a testing center and, the testing center may be, you know, days away instead of like, for me, it's a couple of hours. Or just not in their country. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean that's entire, I mean, remember the world is the world. Yes. Yeah, and, yes. you know, having kind of a, a satellite uplink, which you could theoretically get anywhere, although there, there are costs associated with that. Right. But I mean, I think this makes it accessible to a larger crowd. It definitely but, does. Um, I mean, so the education part of this, just making the knowledge democratic that i think has been achieved through through organizations like edX. edX isn't the only one frank heck youtube <laughs> right coursera uh is another one yeah you can get an education for free on youtube i mean right um there's a, a lot of colleges out there that are putting material online for free in these spaces even in data science and and the like um, so as far as gaining the information, I think that goal has been achieved and I applaud that. Um, I, but I do understand because I've experienced it and you've experienced it that, um, that I, I think and I'll say it this way. I believe Microsoft is going to update the criteria for the, um, you know, for their partner program. Yeah. Um, but Think about this side of it. Suppose you've checked the boxes. What if you're one of those companies that's made it to a gold status, you know, say in AI and, you know, and Microsoft throws a door open and says, you know, well, all you have to do is pass this 10 course thing that you can do remotely in one quarter. Right. That, you know, if I'm holding, 
you know, if I'm kind of holding that, <laughs> that access, basically, uh, that that level of relationship with Microsoft at that point, I don't know that that'd make me happy. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know how that. I see what you mean, but I think, I think the purpose is, and and so there's two questions. There's really two questions that Avinash asked. One was kind of like, why are there two certification paths? And the other was, which one should he do? Yeah. I think we kind of answered the first part of that question. Of, we did. Uh, that's why there's two, right? One is kind of a, an established thing that's been going on since at least the 90s. Yep. Um, and there's a whole industry around training for that. Yep. Uh, and then the other one is one that's been around for two years, basically. Right. Um, although MOOCs arguably have been around a little longer, but I mean, effectively, in the Microsoft certification space, it's only been around about two years. Right. Right. Actually, not even. I think they opened the plan to the public in November of 2016. And I'm trying to remember. Um, I want to say when I when I searched, and if you, if you hear typing in the background, this is me typing. Um, I I searched for Microsoft Professional Program, and I came up with academy.microsoft.com. That's where it is, yeah, which is, is part it? of another training um, academy.microsoft.com, I think slash dashboard or something like that. It's, I, so I, I thought I ran into two different, oh, I know what it was. I searched for Microsoft Academy. That's what it was. Cause I could remember it was Microsoft Academy, but what it took me to was confusing. It was MBA, mm -hmm. Microsoft Virtual Academy. Dot, oh uh, yeah. Dot yeah. Which is a, uh, the, most of the content on the MVA you don't get certified for, kind of in the right. traditional sense. But there's a lot of good stuff on there. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not knocking yeah, that. Yeah. It's just I was looking for my data science. I think at the time I, I'd made some progress in the data science curriculum, and I was trying to find that dashboard that told me how many I'd finished and how many I needed. Right. And I, I went to the MVA site, and I was like, "Where is that?" <laughs> and I couldn't find it. And I was confused because both of them had Microsoft Academy in their name, yeah. it's not MBA. My, um, um, Mike Victor Alpha for you former military people. Um, it was uh, that's that's Microsoft Virtual Academy. The Microsoft Professional Program, however, is under Academy.Microsoft.com, and that's why I got confused. Right, so, just to confuse you. No, well, it wasn't just to confuse me, but it, it, it worked. <laughs> I'm, I'm easily confused. But I'll say, you know, getting back to uh, Avinash's second question, which one should he choose? You and I both replied to him on this. Right. And and my reply was along the lines of, you, you know, what is it? What's the problem you're trying to solve? Are you just trying to learn the information or are you in this for some sort of I, I don't know, some, you know, like a notch on your resume or something like that. And and really both are good for both of those. The the truth is right. Um, right. I I've done both. I was a Microsoft certified solutions developer back before dot net, back when the years began with a one, Frank. Whoa. I was an MCSD. And um it was it was different back then. I mean, that certification wasn't one that lent itself to paper certs. You know, there was another I won't mention that, you know, you could go to a boot camp for a week or two and pay 10 grand and they guaranteed you would pass the test. Uh, oh, that was a whole industry. It was. And it was I mean, it, it wasn't just one company or one no, no. company that the certification I mean, there was this like uh um uh, there was I mean, it was a you could throw a stick and at least when I lived in New York and New Jersey, it was like, um, you could throw a stick, you'd find some, a, an ad for it, you know? Right. And, and it was what it ended up doing. I mean, effectively for that particular designation, um, it eventually it eroded uh, confidence right. in the market in that certification. You didn't know when you saw that on a resume, am I getting somebody who actually knows what they're doing or am I getting somebody who had $10,000 in two weeks? Um, and that's different. Right. Those are two extremes, mind you, right. uh, of that. And it was rare that you had someone that fell into that second category. In my opinion, it was much more rare than, but, but the certification suffered as a result of that. 
So, well, it also had a black eye for a while, where certification, at least, was not really seen as a critical thing. Yeah. Yep. At least uh, in my experience. Yeah, mine too. But I think, uh, but I think what's interesting though is um, a lot of thought goes into the exams, uh, the the traditional exams where you go in front of a computer and you sit through. Oh, I've and, written questions for those, Frank. So you know, you know, a lot I of know. work goes into that, and I'm not it's saying crazy. not a lot of work goes into the 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 edX ones. Yeah. But the way the edX ones are structured is that they're much more modular. Yeah. In fact, you actually see this with the Power BI edX class, uh -huh. uh, where they can update the content uh, because Power BI moves so damn fast, uh, which is a good thing. But yeah. like they've actually, you actually see where they've inserted modules and they've removed stuff, uh -huh. and that's why the edX courses go from quarter to quarter because they update them quarterly. Right. So right. updating one of those traditional tests is a much bigger process. So I also think the other advantage, at least from, from, from Microsoft's point of view, is they can be a lot more agile. Yep. Particularly in a field like data science and AI where things are moving fast. Well, you, you, you picked the perfect example. Right. I mean, uh, Power BI, get, there's a new release every month. As far as I know, they, they've hit that. I think they may have skipped a couple of months in the last couple of years. But they've had just release. And not only are they doing you know, general availability release of features and new stuff, they're adding experimental features. And, and some of those, they show up this month and next month they're gone. <laughs> you know? Right. And, and well, the other thing is that the, um, the service is updated, I think you've told me as many as several times a week at some times. I, I have seen it change. I have seen things change in the cloud. Um, and you weren't just being forgetful? <laughs> well, I, you know, Frank, since we recorded last, I had a birthday. And I am no longer a junior citizen. So, oh, yeah, but you get like discounts and stuff now. I've heard that, but I haven't exercised it yet. I think part uh, of it is me trying. It's like a way for me to hold on to my my youth. It's like denying I'm a senior citizen. There you go. I don't know. What does that mean anymore? I'm 55 years old. I mean, I don't know. We I talked. We talked about this offline mm -hmm. when I was a kid. When you were a kid. 55, man, people were in wheelchairs, they were in walkers, they were in right. nursing homes. And it's like, you know, I'm not trying to brag, I promise. But five years ago, Frank, I ran a half marathon, okay? There you go, man. <laughs> there you go. It's, I think it's different for the most part. Now, granted, people still, I still know people, you know, who are younger than 55 who suffer from, from health issues, from aging, age-related health stuff. I get that. But I think we've learned a whole slew of like dumb little things that, you know, like don't drink soda, uh, right. <laughs> get plenty of rest, eat good food, lose right. weight. If you're vitamins, overweight. vitamins. Yes. Yeah. It's, you know, we're just, we just do a bad. And I, I mean, it's a, it's the inverse of a hundred paper cuts, right? It's right. You know, it's a little dumb things. Take it low dose aspirin, you know, right. stuff like that. Anyway. Well, my mom's in her 70s, and she's bouncing around. She probably yeah. does need to live in uh, a more controlled environment. She refuses to. Oh, wow. But that's a whole other show. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, we need, we need to have a rant show. I can feel it. I coming. know. We need to have, like, a second show. That's It's almost <laughs> like I'm dropping a hint there. Um, but, uh, no, but, I mean, age has is, age is really, I think, changed dramatically. It has. Um, but now we're I on a, another sidetrack. Which... I know, I know. But <laughs> so to get back to Avinash's question, I think the answer is it depends on, you know, it depends is, you know, the classic answer, right? Right. Um, Are we still talking about aging with the pens? Well, no, or... I've, I've, I've jumped <laughs> back over the three tracks back to Avinash. Thanks. It does, well, that depends too. No. That was, I just got that. That was me. Oh, really? <laughs> it's probably because I'm so old. Oh, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Darn you, Frank Lavinia. Darn you. That's it. That's uh, the paybacks, brother. Paybacks oh, are coming. I'm making a note. I didn't mean it that way. It was just like you said, the pen. No, I get I it. Like, Wait a minute. Injury. Frank Lavinia, serious injury. August 2nd, <laughs> 2018. Yeah. It's in the book. Just uh just make sure you store the book with Clear DB and they'll they'll erase the book. <laughs> Ouch.
Um, <laughs> but anyway, Avinash. back to Avinash's question. Yeah, poor Avinash. That no, was a great question. It no, it was an awesome lot. question. Yeah. But I mean, so so here's my kind of two cents boiled down into two or three sentences, um, which would be: if you work for a Microsoft Gold Partner, um, do what's required to get that status. Right. You know what I mean. But if you're just kind of, you know, on your own and, you know, you're not, you're, you're an organization that either doesn't have this or, you know, has thousands of employees and they don't have to worry about that. Right. Uh, because over a thousand, somebody, you know, somebody, there'll be enough people to meet that requirement. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say for educational purposes, I prefer the edX for two reasons. One, it's asynchronous. Right. Right. I can do it. I can, I can pull out the app on my phone if I'm waiting in line at the supermarket. I can. Mm-hmm. I can listen to the content while I'm driving. I could uh, do it after my kids go to bed. I can do it, you know, uh, if I get up real early in the morning and work out and watch it on on, on an iPad, which you, you know I have done. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, all it, of I, the above. You've done all it, the yeah. above. So it, it it's more flexible, and I don't have to block out a series of time when you know the phone is off and all that and stuff. Right. Um. So I think from that point of view, it's 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 good. It's also more approachable in the sense that it's just a module, right? Yes. As opposed to kind of like you know this, and it's also interesting is the the test that I did take, and I forget the number. I think it was ninety dash four seventy three or four seventy five. It's just sad. I don't know the name, but I know the number. <laughs> um, but um, they they said the best way to prepare this is take these three edX classes which happened to be part of the data engineering track, which wow. two of them I'd already taken and this one I hadn't. So I think it may not, you know, the future may not be either or, it may be and, yes and. Well, I'd like to see them do that. I think that would, you know, of course, part of the reason I'd like to see them is just pure selfishness, right? Right. Um, I'd like to, to have some progress towards upping my partner status uh, for my company. By the way, I just searched for 90-475 using a yeah. popular search engine. It brought up calculator and told me negative 385. <laughs> um, this is why we can't let the algorithms run everything. <laughs> Which so, is actually, uh, I know you have a thought left, but that actually is a good segue into our second question. Go it ahead. is. No, no, it's good. I finally found it. 90-475 exam Microsoft takes me to... 7475. I'm sorry, that was uh, 70. That's it. Yeah. Designing and implementing a big data, I guess, solution. I can't see it until I with Azure Data Factory or something like that. Yeah. That's what it was. Okay. Yeah. $165. Which is actually lower than list price. I know. It's got an asterisk beside it. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay. So our next question. Right. Our next question comes from Bob, who I believe lives in the UK. So that's why we didn't say his last name. <laughs> just a little GDPR humor for you. Sorry. Yes. Um, no, just kidding. Um, basically, his question is um, that uh, with all the AI testing that's going on, uh, with all the uh, – and let me rephrase that – with all the AI implementations going on, um, how do you know when it's wrong? Like, what's the story with data quality? What's the story with testing it out to make sure it's accurate? Uh, and he points out that in traditional kind of old school systems like enterprise accounting, programmers would test it. Uh, you know, they would do their own unit testing, and then they, they would hand it on to basically a series of uh, of of Q and A or QA to, not Q and A QA testers. Um, right. And then they would um, go through and make sure that a system was well tested. But with things like artificial intelligence and neural networks, how do you test them, right? Because one of the one of the things about neural networks is you don't really know what's going on inside them. Uh, Can't you, you really get only an know... AI? Can't you get what? an AI to test it for you? <laughs> oh, there you go. That's very meta. Uh, <laughs> but what we're seeing now is that data scientists or data science departments are handing this their their trained algorithms straight to the users and they're being right. deployed and he, he sent an article of of uh basically that um uh criminal um facial uh criminal mugshots where they do facial recognition 
mm-hmm. uh, erroneously flagged a number of members of Congress. I think 28 was the number. See, I'm not so sure that was an error. Yeah, I, I, I think in our <laughs> private message you said, are you really sure that this was a false positive? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm just going to leave I'm that just, there I'm just because saying. you can't really say much more than that. It's like, hmm, I wonder. <laughs> Um, but I think, I think this really speaks to the importance of ethics uh, in AI. Uh, Agree. And, uh, and that's interesting is that one of the courses they've added um, recently was ethics and law in AI to the AI stack, uh, AI uh, certification on edX. And as well, I think they backfilled it into the um, data, data scientist one. Because as, yeah. you know, if you're talking about, you know, who's going to pay their cell phone bill on time? It doesn't matter, right? I mean, it obviously it matters if you're the telephone company, but um, in the scheme of like life and death, it's not really, if you mistakenly flag someone, it's not, no one's going to die from that. But if you start right. allocating, um, you know, law enforcement resources based on data that may or may not be biased right. or, you know, medical test uh, results, then people's lives are on the line and it starts to become more of a, a serious ethical issue. Well, what's interesting in this conversation, in the timing of this and totally disconnected, um, uh, only, only through being friends with me, your friends with me and um, uh, another friend who I, I hope to get on the show. He's done a lot of really interesting work. I'm not going to say his name, but we want to get him on the show probably twice because he's working on some really cool stuff. He put a tweet out um, it's earlier today. He said data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and related technologies are now facing a day of reckoning, and it's time for us to take some responsibility for our creations. And it was a, qu- a quote from the O'Reilly.com website, and I reposted it. And Buck Woody, who has been a, a guest on the show before, um, actually replied to that and said, indeed, uh, actually teaching a class on AI today, and I always start with ethics. And he provided the link, aka.ms slash AI-ethics. Uh, we'll put that in the show notes for sure, but the you're right. I mean, it's it's not that the machines, it's certainly not that the machines are malicious. We get that. I mean, that makes for a great Hollywood plot. I understand. At least that. not yet. The machines are not malicious yet. Oh, well, kidding. okay, that's fair, <laughs> but they are. Um, we've already seen um, chatbots get co-opted by right. being fed, you know, by being fed a stream, and what they're they're trained on in the eighty twenty tests that they're or seventy thirty tests they're trained on. They are, you know, they're trained on a big chunk of the data, and then they're handed another chunk to be tested with. And this goes right back to Bob's question. This is the way we we typically. Uh, we call it training uh, the AI, but it's really a, it really is a form of unit testing where we're looking to see, you know, what are the false positives and uh, the chaos uh, matrix that comes out of that. Those can be tested to see, you know, what are our false positives? What are our true positives? What are our false negatives? What are our true negatives? And you can do the, you know, the math on that and, and determine, is this good enough? And you know this, Frank, I know this. At the end of the day, it's a percentage of, you know, of rightness that we're looking for. The, the percentage is never 100. Right. <laughs> it's, and for some, the answer is 60 plus. For others, the answer is, you know, 70, 80, maybe a few for 90. But you and I both know this. It's hard to get 90%. Well, the uh, other thing, too, is anything above 90%. I start to get suspicious that the model's not it overfitted. It's a flag. Yeah, exactly. Right. I was just, yeah. So it's, it's an error. It fails the test if it's that good. So, right. And for those of you who are confused about the term overfitting, we'll, we'll probably do a deep dive on that. We need to, and yeah. we'll put a, a link to, uh, to some articles in the show notes about that. It's, it is an interesting problem. Um, that right. I had your never model heard can be of. too good to be trustable. <laughs> yeah, which I'd never which, heard of this. Right. So here's a quick thing that I get an example I gave to the high school students yesterday. And it's short, I swear. 
which is like my famous last words. Um, so if you create a model that's 100% accurate, uh, one of two things have happened. You either created an overfitted model that won't really be good against real data in production, or you've created a model that takes into account all of the entropy in the universe, and you've discovered it first, at which point you should stop what you're doing and start a hedge fund and invite Andy <laughs> and me for a spin on your yacht and or private jet. Because we, with this show, helped inspire you. There you go. And all we're not asking for money. We're just asking for a joy ride. Um, so one of two, one of those two things has happened. One's more likely than the other, and I'll let our listeners figure out which which that is. <laughs> Occam's razor, brother. There you go. Yes. I always wondered, so, did Occam have a beard, or was he clean shaven? Excellent point. What was he doing with his razor? We don't want to know. Yeah, we'll. <laughs> So, um, no, Bob asked a really good question. And my answer to that, I, I just saw it um, just a couple hours ago, uh, read through that, actually less than an hour ago. I was reading through it, and my my thinking is it was twofold. One, that's a really good question. Second, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to this. I don't know, you know, it's like just like overfitting is a problem I didn't run into until I started fooling around with uh, you know, with statistics and data science. Um, I'm, I hadn't thought about data science in the context of testing. Now, I have thought about data engineering and testing. I've written about it. I've, I, if you go to your favorite search engine and type in ETL instrumentation, I own that topic. Yeah. I mean, I'm like five of the first 10, okay? And it's old, and I never finished the series. I actually wrote six articles. I only published four. I need to finish that. I need to update it and finish it. But testing ETL or, or data engineering, that's not hard. Testing data science, it's like you're asking, are these statistics accurate? And, and while we all want the answer to that question to be yes, Bob's question is, how do you know? Right. You don't, don't know, know what you don't know. Yeah. I would suspect, and I think there's going to be parallels drawn to the software industry. Software testing was not really a thing uh, yeah. when it first came out. You, you, you built true. it. Did it work? Yes, it worked. Bugs were the bugs fixing cycle. This is way before yeah. DevOps was a, a gleam in anyone's eye. True, true. And I really think that we're going to see this kind of... Um, evolve as time goes along because i think there's such a rush to get to market so i i re responded to him out uh, via email uh about something else he asked um was basically you know this you know this is taken as seriously as iot uh as as security is taken in iot and consumer devices right now right because it's just the rush to market right and right. I, and he wrote back with a you know touche so uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> which which Bob's i think smart. We'll Bob is a that. smart guy. Well, obviously, he listened to us. So, um, well, there you go. Um, but I mean, I, I mean, it's just one of those things where I think this is going to evolve, and yeah. I think there's there's the elephant in the room is um, the notion of bias in data, and I didn't really buy into this until I kind of thought about it, and I think that um, and there's a couple problems with this, and this probably warrants its own deep dive too. Um, I came to the conclusion that all data sets are biased, have bias in them. Oh, yeah. And the problem in part is due to the word bias. Because you talk to a statistician, bias yeah. means something to, different to them than it does on the news, right? Bias, and, uh, at right. least in, in colloquial use, is that the right word? Uh, yeah. In common use, is uh, implies some kind of uh, malicious forethought. That's true, right? But I think bias in terms of because uh, I was at a, I was speaking at a thing and and it was a bunch of statisticians there and they're like, well, when you say bias, what do you mean? Do you mean statistical bias or do you mean um, um, cultural bias or, or uh, psychological bias? Right. And I was like, well, somewhere in the middle. Uh, and the example I gave is, um, you know, if I own a lemonade stand and I collected data on everyone who buys lemonade from me. 
from my neighborhood. Do I have an accurate picture of the neighborhood? Probably not. I only yeah. have a picture of people who bought lemonade from me, right? So I don't know who the diabetics are, right? right. I don't know who the people, I don't know. Can you be allergic to lemonade? I, I don't know the people. Actually. Let's pretend I put gluten in my lemonade. Um, I don't have data on people I don't serve, right? Right. That's kind of a Captain Obvious statement, which in this example is not really a big deal, right? But let's think right. about law enforcement. Law enforcement only has data on people who interact with law enforcement. Right. You know, and let's think, do we really want to live in a society where law enforcement collects data on everybody? <laughs> the answer to that is no. No, we do not. But we may be, in fact, living in. <laughs> well, that's a whole other. A, that warrants that's another a show. show. Yeah. So we're, we're pretty good on the content front there, Andy. We um, are. We're, we, we need to do more. We could do like a show a day for the rest of August. Yeah, uh, seriously. Just on the stuff we brought up. But yeah, here's, here's what I would say. About, no, sir. But here's here's what I'm thinking, Frank, about that. Um, you know, there, when when you think about software testing, let's step step back to those days. What you talked about, the evolution of software testing, um, reminded me briefly of a T-shirt Christy made for me. It's a it's a saying of mine, and it's uh, it says all software is tested, some intentionally. <laughs> I think I've seen that shirt. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've got banners I put out on social media. I don't think I've done it recently, but I should. I'll, maybe we'll stick that on. Uh, I'll send you a copy of that. We'll put it on this show when we get it up there. But it's true. And the customers were actually testing the software back then and they were right. filing bugs. And then we, you know, have bugs to do it. And that's, and, and that cycle to some extent is still available today, but you're right. This whole thing that grew into what we now consider software testing did not exist when you and I started writing code. Right. And, and so, and when it came to exist, this is my first point, is when it came to exist, it really didn't look anything like uh, what we anticipated. You no. know, as a software developer, testing is this really alien thing. And I'm not trying to pick on software developers. And I know there are developers out there who can do testing. I know that they exist. And I can do it a little bit. Um, but at, even for, you know, I have to put time between when I'm, when I'm developing and when I'm testing. And for me, it's days. I have to not develop software for days and right. then test that software because it is a complete completely alien mindset to software well, development. Well, it's like running on gasoline versus diesel, right? It's just completely it different really parts is. of your brain. If there's a funny t-shirt I saw about it. I, I can't I can't do it justice. I'll try to find the image and maybe we'll put that on here too. But the um, it was about software testing and it says, you know, it started with something like a user walks into a bar and orders one beer. Nah. And the user walks into the bar and orders two beers. The user walks into the bar and orders a million beers. The user walks into a bar and orders Z asterisk begin paren beers. <laughs> you know, it, and it goes on like that. Null, null is one of the response. Orders null beers. Um, and it goes on and on. And it's funny. Is that, you know, that's the real, it's a beautiful t-shirt. Um, but that's how foreign it is. It's, it's, you know, it's it's so far out of the box. There is no box. So well, and that's kind of the point because well, it is. It it has to be. But what is that now? Now, what does that look like? So, you know, we're thinking. You and I are thinking early '80s, right? Developing software, right. and then software testing shows up, and it really becomes a thing. I want to say in the late '90s. Yeah. Then it's this new foreign thing. All right, we're in the early '80s of data science. Yeah. So what is this thing going to look like in the 2020s or whenever it hits, you know, or maybe early 2030? What, what's that testing thing? I think it's going to be completely foreign. I was only half joking about an AI doing it. <laughs> <laughs> that was only a half joke, Frank. Uh, I, I imagine that could be automated, but, you know, I don't know. I don't know what that looks like, but I think it's going to be something so different and right. so you know, so out there for it. And, but you are absolutely right though. You know, it has to be, whatever they come up with has to be right. It's almost, 
it's almost going to have that Hall of Mirrors thing going, I think. You're going to have to test the testing. That well, who sense. watches the watchers, right? That's exactly. A... Yeah, right? How do you do that? So I don't know. I don't know the answer to Bob's question. I think it's a phenomenal question. And um, I'm glad he asked. I, I wish I had an answer. I, I think it's a good one of the, you know, it's one of those things I'll noodle on when I wake up in the middle of the night. Right, right. No, it's a good question. And I think that as AI becomes, uh, I think it probably wasn't a coincidence, though, that, that software testing became a thing in the 90s yeah. when software became more and more of a consumer facing uh, kind of controls a lot more of our day to day life. Um, probably not a coincidence. And I suspect the same for AI too. It may not take as long because AI yeah. is already impacting our lives. Uh-huh. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, it's, it's somewhere that, um, cause I think most data scientist people are going to come from with their headspace in the stats world where we're like, well, bias means X, Y, Z to me. Right. Um, of course we tested it because of the 80, 20, 70, 30 split. <laughs> right. Right. But there's testing and then there's testing. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, it's like, does any of that see part of the inherent stuff that, that you reminded me of, you know, I was just talking about the t-shirt, the Z asterisk begin paren beers. Um, you know, that's, but that stuff you take out in the data engineering step, <laughs> right? That's a cleansing. You have to get that out of there. So, you know, again, I don't know. If I, I'm not saying that we need to put that back and then have the data science engines, you know, account for that, the analytics engines, but it creates a, it creates a different spot. And maybe some of the testing, maybe a lot of the testing then occurs in the, uh, in the cleansing, but, that's a different type of testing. Data quality testing, you know, I've been preaching about data warehouse quality forever, Frank, um, because it takes a surprising, it's a surprisingly high number, the quality of the data warehouse, uh, the data in the data warehouse. It, it's a surprisingly high number when that data is useless. I mean, for predictive analytics, it's it's north of 99%, you know? Wow. Think about it. When you start doing the projections on stuff like that, think about what that looks like. It's it's a line. It's a curve usually. And you get that you get the wrong curve off a half a degree at the beginning. And then you exponentiate or worse, throw a geometric progression on that. You are way, way off in the future. Oh, that's true. <laughs> It's Very it's true. that kind of thing. It's not, we're not dealing with straight lines here. That's just not the way the world works. So, you know, the data quality has to, and what does data quality look like in a data warehouse? It can be the dumbest things, Frank. It can be counts. And if you have duplicates in there where you're counting the same thing twice, if if you've got nulls in there, maybe you're missing something. If maybe the null is valid in that field, but you're not counting it because the value is not. Or what if it says the the four letter string of null rather than actually be a null value? Oh, that happened to me. Somebody did that once. I was anyway. Yes. <laughs> well, there's actually a story. We'll put this in the show notes about um, some some lady whose last name is Null. Oh, that's just wrong. And um, she can't book flight. I mean, there's a whole list of things that she can't do. I it's had very... not heard that story. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, but it's just like, uh, I, yeah. I think the bottom line for to answer Bob's question is is that we're still early in the in the game, and yeah, uh, like you said, we're in the early '80s. Will this go faster yeah. because we kind of done this before? I don't know. I don't know either. It'll be interesting to see. I'm I'm glad that I'm glad Bob's thinking about it because, like I said, he's obviously intelligent. Um. I would, I, you know, it's, it's, somebody's going to have to think that, think about that and figure that out. Right. I don't know, man. Maybe it could be Bob. Maybe Bob could be the next uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Maybe. Is that, is that a compliment? <laughs> uh, as, as soon as I said, this name came off my list. I was like, mm, why don't we say <laughs> Steve Jobs? Uh- <laughs> Although, arguably, maybe that's not, you know, maybe I should just yeah. stop talking. 
<laughs> Everybody has strengths and weaknesses. We could say it that way. I think. There you go. Man, we'll be we'll be fair, as fair so as speaking, we can be. Speak of interesting people, I um, Richard Branson, the founder of the Virgin Group, mm-hmm. um, and known for kind of his big publicity stunts, uh, has a new audio book out that I've listened to on Audible. Now, does he read this book? He do- no, it's not him, unfortunately, but it's another oh. British guy. But I think if he read it, it would be very interesting because he's he's quite the character. I don't always kind of agree with what he says or does, but uh, he is at least creative. I'll give him that. Yeah, yeah. And um, I wonder if he's involved in the data space. I know he's got like uh, probably about half a dozen businesses. Yeah, um, big businesses his, too. Big businesses, but it's interesting how – close to the edge of failing a lot of his businesses were at various points oh wow and like you can see like you know he's definitely a very adrenaline driven person that's for sure but he he, he's pulled himself out of the fire almost every time so it's like wow wow interesting guy that's for sure sounds interesting so you know there's a there's books out there like um you know, books about people, biographies, autobiographies, books kind of about like Richard Branson telling the story of his businesses. Um, there's some, there's, you know, those classics and all of that by, uh, by Audible. I actually saw a commercial for Audible uh, on television. Really? And I watched so little television. It's odd that I would, you know, that first off I would see any commercials, but I saw this. I think I was watching Shark Week. I confess I watched Shark Week, uh, some of it on Discovery Channel, and um, I enjoyed it. Um, I, well, I'll say I enjoyed some of it. It wasn't the best Shark Week I've ever seen, <laughs> but they, uh, but yeah, I believe it was a commercial on Shark Week for Audible, and I had not seen one on television before. But Audible is a sponsor of uh, of our podcast here of Data Driven. And Frank, do you remember the URL that our listeners can go to that they can they can score a free book, a free Audible download, and and listen to an audio book rather than having to you know carry a book or a reader around with them. They can actually listen to somebody read a book. Yes, so that would be thedatadrivenbook.com, where the uh, they'll hook our listeners up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they get a, I think it's a free 30 day starter subscription and they get a free book with that. And yep. yeah, it's, it's great. I'm signed up. Um, we, we do this. We, um, I forget what we pay each month, but we're not the, we're not the low level because my older son started listening to a bunch of books and he's really gotten into that the past six months or so. Stevie Ray, um, he likes the Joe Ledger series. Of, of books, which is kind of like, I don't know, I don't know how to describe Joe Ledger. I actually, I read one of the books on my Kindle and enjoyed it. Um, and I'm trying to remember the author's name. Now I've got to look it up. You're going to hear. So while you're looking, oh, so while you're looking it up, I will, uh, I will point out that if you, if you do say uh, sign up as an Audible subscriber, then uh, we get, uh, we get a commission. So that helps support the show and enrich your mind uh because there's topics on there's books on topics all over the place there's even a data science book or two uh in audiobook format there you know there is one of the books that got us in by the way jonathan mayberry is the name of the author of the joe ledger series and if these don't become like a movie or tv or something i don't know what will but great great series of books very interesting very kind of like techno military if you will interesting um yep so the the um unicorns among us book frank you turned me on to that early on that's a uh about a two-hour listen i want to say it's about a hundred page book yeah um i listened to it and it was it was really good actually that's one i listened to and was so inspired by it i wanted to be able to search so i bought the kindle version Um, that's what's nice about electronic books you can search (laughs) right (laughs) um but yeah, great book. I've actually used quotes from that um, in just about every presentation since then, Frank. So dozens Very of cool. presentations have included quotes from Unicorns Among Us, Lars Nielsen. Uh, but I listened to that person on Audible. 
it's a great listen. Like I said, a couple hours. You got a road trip coming up? Got it like one hour there, one hour back? Yeah, I just like it for my commute because it just helps me turn that dead time into something useful. Doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. All right, so with that, uh, let's let the nice British lady end the show. Thanks for listening to Data Driven. Don't just listen, become a data driver by going to datadriven.tv to sign up to join the community, access to special events, tips and tricks, and more. Sign up today at datadriven.tv.